Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, I want to share with you one of my favorite prayers in the Bible, which is Matthew chapter 6. It is talking about the Lord's Prayer. Now, this chapter, if you ever want to answer to racism, racial reconciliation, how to treat people, how to live each day, um, and be in the will of God, this is a chapter for you right here. It covers those basic principles that you need to take on the day because the day can be very dreadful. You know, you could get up this morning and scammers have attacked your account or you hear that this person is sick, this person have cancer, this person passed away, um, car accident. The day can be very dreadful. But we need to know how to take on the day, how to live above those obstacles that may come your way. The Lord's Prayer will give you that insight, give you wisdom in how to be an overcomer in your daily lives. Let's dig into it. Look how it started out. It said, and when you pray, and when you pray, let me ask you, you see, we can't pray effectively if we don't understand what prayer is. Prayer is not a buffet. I know many times we may use to that buffet. We like to pick and choose and reject and do all that. Or we may say, prayer is not a way to rob a lamb so a genie may pop out and give you all your wishes. Prayer is communication with your father. So in order to communicate with your father, you must come through Jesus Christ. How do we come through Jesus Christ? We surrender ourselves to him and make Christ our Lord and Savior. So for us to pray effectively, we must be saved. I can't be worshiping Buddha over here. I can't be worshiping Allah and pray effectively. No, it doesn't work that way. In order to pray effectively, you must surrender your life to Christ. People say, well, I've been praying for years and I'm, I'm not a Christian and God answer all my prayers. Yeah, he's trying to point you into the direction of the Savior. And many times God will intervene in your situation to point you to, to Christ so you may surrender yourself to him. So... When we pray, we must understand that we're communicating with God and we're coming to God through Jesus Christ. That is why when we come to God through Jesus Christ, the Bible said the Father has adopted you. We were once vagabonds. We were once lost. We were once fatherless. But here... The Father has adopted you because of your relationship with Christ. And now he, the Bible said he calls us dear children. So again, in order to pray effectively, we must be saved, period. Then he said now, when you pray, don't do this. 
Don't be a hypocrite. It's, it is easy to be a hypocrite when you pray. Number one, if you don't, okay, let's look what a hypocrite is. Actually, in our days, we use the word actors. Like, for example, um, Denzel Washington or Brad Pitt is an actor. Back in the 1900s, 1930s, or even before that, they never used to use the word hack actors. They would say hypocrites because you're acting. You're playing a role. And that's why it said, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Or, <coughs> excuse me. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues, or we may say in the church, we may say in the tabernacle or temples, and on the street corners to be seen of others. So we know about that. We know how that goes. Um, it's like, Lord Jesus. Oh, and you know, people, especially when people watching us, we want to put on a show when we pray. Lord, my God, you are an awesome guy. Many times these people change their voices. They don't even talk like this in their regular um, communication or uh, when they communicate with people. They don't talk like this. Heavenly Father, oh God, I bow my knees and hey, who are you? I don't even recognize who you are when you pray. Even some go beyond when they preach. What is that? So it's like, if I'm going to pray, be simple. You don't have to put on a show like the hypocrites because they like to be seen by people. They like when people glorify them. They love this. I don't like attention. I don't like people come to me and say, oh, brother, you this, you that. I don't, because I don't, I don't want to ever feel as though I'm taking glory away from God. No, we encourage each other. I do it all the time. I tell people they are, you're, you're, you're an amazing person. You're beautiful. You're handsome. You're an overcomer. Yeah, I give people comment. I personally don't like it, but I do do it. But in order to pray effectively, we have to refrain from being a hypocrite. And again, it's so easy to be a hypocrite when you're praying to God and you're not saved. When you're looking for the attention and the glorification of man, you're looking for that honor from man. He said that love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Look what it's saying now. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. I do like the King James Version and the um, ESV and New King James Version better. But I use all the versions. So now, now, um, they already got their reward. Because what they really wanted, they may not say this. What they really wanted is the attention of man. So when you pray, you got the attention of man. You already got your reward. But it said now in verse 6, but when you pray, go into your room. You see, this is totally different. Because now, 
by going into your room or going into a closet or going into a secret place, you're not going to get the attention of man. So by you actually doing this, you're not being like the hypocrite. By you going into that secret room, yes, there's occasion where we pray in public. Um, you may be asked to pray in church. Um, but in this case, when you're talking to God, in your own personal life, when you're not, um, what do you call it again? When you're not in a place where, even then, I don't mean to get off the point, even then you have to be careful. Because again, when you're asked to pray in church, we find that all of a sudden again, your voice change. It's like, again, Father, Oh, 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 Lord. You know, it's like, again, who are you? Who is this? I thought this was Brother Sean. He sound totally different. Is he possessed with something? What's wrong with just praying Father in heaven? I know that when we're praying, we, we, especially in public, we're in a more formal setting, so we may um, pray in a certain way. But there's times when it's like, I got to put on a show. You got your reward, because now you're like the hypocrites. But by going into your closet, by going into that secret room, and it said, close the door. So now, not only that, you go into the secret room, he said, close the door. So you're definitely not going to get the attention of man, but you will get the attention of God. Because it's just you and him now. And if you value your relationship with God, if you value communion with God, if you value praying and speaking to your father through Jesus Christ, this won't be an issue for you. You're excited to go into your room, to close that door, and to pray to your heavenly Father. And then say, let's read verse 6 again. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Some version will say, we'll reward you openly. We'll reward you openly. So here, um, pray to your unseen God in secret so you don't be like the hypocrite and God will reward you for that. So you may say, Oh, I've been praying and my prayers haven't answered. Number one, are you safe? Number two, are you being like the hypocrites? Then they come down and said in verse seven, and when you pray, do not keep on, keep babbling like the pagans. Some cultures who don't know God, they pray too. They pray to their God. And some people will babble on or say all kind of chant. You know, whoa, 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 whoa. All kind of weird chant. Um, this doesn't work with our God, Yahweh. It does not work with him. It doesn't work with him. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. I'm guilty of this too in the sense that I pray long. Sometimes when you're praying all kind of different things come to mind and you, 
it's like the Holy Spirit just bringing things to your remembrance. But there are times when people will pray again to be heard and to be seen by man that they may be like the hypocrites who already got their reward to be seen. They will keep on just praying and going on and on and on and on and on. Listen to this. It said, you, you will not be heard because you are praying an entire 400 or 500 page book. That's how long your prayers. You just keep on babbling on, saying all kind of weird things. Then they come down and said, do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask of him. Powerful. When you look at this, your father knows what you need before you ask. So prayer is not only to ask of God, but prayer also um, line you up with the will of God. This is one of my favorite explanations. I probably have explained it in almost all the videos um, that I've made. You're going to hear me talk about God's revealed will and God's secret will. My some of my favorite things to talk about. Then you'll hear me use an analogy when I used to work with DirecTV that um, I have a meter that would line the dish on your house with the dish in space. The meter lines it up so you can get signal. Prayer lines you up with the will of God. That's what prayer does. So um, prayer is not only where you go just to make requests. Lord, give me that. Lord, give me that. Lord, give me that. Bless me here. Touch this. You know, prayer is not only for that, but it lines you up with will, the will of God. That's why people may act. people have said prayer is either no, yes, or wait. I may say that differently. When you ask God for something, he always give it to you. But there's times where God may give you better than what you're asking for. So you may ask him for a car. And God may do something totally different. That will blow your mind. But because you're lined up with God, you're communicating with him. You're building your relationship with him. Whatever you ask of him, he will give you. Like, for example, I asked God for a car once. I asked God for a car. This here, this testimony of prayer is dear to my heart. I asked God for a car. My car got repoed. Maybe for the third time. A young lady gave me a Honda. And when I got the Honda, God, God gave me an old car. He didn't give, give me a car like what these prosperity preachers are talking about. You know, I had a sticker on my car that said, real men love Jesus. Then you had a, a man said to me, you shouldn't have a sticker like that on your car. Because your car is old and messed up. That man teased me, my tires, everything on my car. I felt so, so horrible inside. Like, man, I was, I'm not doing good at all, according to him. Now, this is an older gentleman, probably was 20, 30 years older than me. You would have figured that at that time, I probably was 20-something. He would have encouraged me, guided me, but instead he was just putting me down. And he said, look at his car. He had a, a, a Benz, but um, 
He didn't even tell me the steps how to get to that point. He just was criticizing me. So now, God gave me an old car. And I said, according to prosperity preachers, this, this here is a no-no. I need to be the head and not the tail. I need to guard very best. So basically, I should, I should get a brand new car and maybe possibly a Benz or BMW or Bentley, according to them. But God gave me a 20-year-old car, or at that time, maybe 16-year-old car. Because of that car, and I'm to make a long story short, because of that car, that old car, that old Honda, I'm able to work as a mechanic today. So that car didn't just take me from point A to B. It led me into a path where I'm able to repair, uh, do computer diagnostic on cars. And that one car led me to this times I have seven cars. They may not be new cars, but I have had Benz and BMWs and whatever. That's where my talent took me because of this one raggedy car. I'm saying raggedy because in the prosperity preacher's mind, this is a no-no. So the point I'm making is that sometime we may, God already knows what we need according to verse 8. It said, do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask of him. He knows your need. So, uh, but what I'm saying People have said, when you pray, God is either a yes, a no. Some people say a maybe. Some people said wait. But no, it's, it's always a yes. Because God is going to now, who is the potter and we are the clay. The more you pray, the more it makes you and mold you into who he wants you to be so you are able to appreciate what he gives you. You see, when I was growing up, my mom took care of me to make sure I had at least one name brand shoes for school so I wouldn't be teased. She did her best. But I say this, I never knew how hard my parents were until I was on my own. I now more appreciate everything they would give me. But you see, then it wasn't a great appreciation because I didn't have the experience. So God wants to make sure you appreciate what he gives you. Because, and that is why he has to mold you and make you into who he wants you to be. So he wants you to appreciate what he gives you. And for him to, for you to appreciate it, he wants you to keep praying. So the more you pray, the more he mold you and make you and prepare you for that prayer. Which sometimes is exactly what you ask for. But I say this, majority of times is way better than what you ask for. Way better. Okay, let's continue now. Look at verse 9. This then is how you should pray. So now, verse 5, when we start out, it said, when you pray, this is how you shouldn't pray, <laughs> right? This is how you should not pray. And then we already cover all that we shouldn't do. Now, verse 9, here Jesus is saying, this is how you should pray. So now we start out 
this is how we shouldn't pray. Now we are getting into a place where this is how we should pray. One of my favorite statement. Woo, I got goosebumps. For racial reconciliation um, that bring all cultures who know God, whether you're a Haitian Christian, a Jamaican Christian, a white Christian, whatever. It brings, this statement brings all people together. Look at it. You ready for it? I don't hear you. You ready? Our Father. You may say, what's so amazing about that statement? The our is plural. It's not just my father. And I, I don't like the term white people and black people. I really don't like it, but I, I'm, I'm going to use it um, in this case. It's not just the black people God, but it's the white people God too. It's not just the white people God, but it's the black people God too. So then... If you and I belong to the same father, that means we are brothers and sisters in the faith. So for those Christians who are white, I'm looking at them as this is my brothers and sisters in the faith. Same go for Spanish people or Indian people or Arab people, whoever come to the Father through Jesus Christ, we now approach God as our Father. So when I'm looking at Christians of a different race than me, I'm looking at them not necessarily that they're white or they're Spanish, but I'm looking at, that's my brother and sister in the faith. And I just want to love on them. And trust me, when you are, when you start to get to know people from other culture, this is deep right here. This is deep. I don't want you to miss this because sometimes I can talk above people's head. But this is deep right here. When, when we um, remember, we were just uh, a lump of clay when we get saved. The Bible says, any man in Christ is a new creature. When I got saved, I, I just now, at the moment of salvation, at the moment of God's irresistible grace, where he saved us, what happened? I now become a new creature. But the Bible said, he is the potter and I'm the clay. So he's going to make us and mold us into the image of Jesus Christ, for us to be like Jesus Christ, for us to be that light unto the world. So that means I'm unfinished. There's many times I want to get up when God is doing the mold, then Lord, I'm good. Father, I'm good. I think I'm all right. So now you may have someone who is gay, who got saved, but he's now being molded into who God wants him to be. So he may have still struggle in that area, but he's a genuine Christian. You may have someone who is a racist who got saved. God is making and molding him into the image of Christ. So he may struggle still with racism. And you may have a person like me who was filled with lust. I was a thief. 
And what happened? God saved me. But at the moment of salvation doesn't mean that I stop lust immediately. It doesn't mean that I stop stealing immediately. Sometime it, that may happen. But God, God is making a moment now, 28 years later, I am at a, a more sanctified, uh, more holy than I was 28 years ago. So we may come into a place and we may see a person struggling with fornication, struggling with drinking, struggling with pornography, struggling with racism, and we'll say, and prejudices, and we may say, that person ain't a Christian. No, that's not true. That's not biblical. They're, they're, you may have a genuine believer who struggle with racism. God is God's work. He has to make and mold them. What God call us to do now is to love that person. It's to love that person. And to serve that person. Oh, I ain't going to serve no races. God, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. As long as that person allowed me to serve them, I'm going to serve them. I'm going to serve them. Because look at this. God, God put people in your life. I always say for three reasons. I came up with three reasons. This is not a biblical fact that there's three reasons. But what I'm saying is biblical. But hear this. When you meet that evil person, that person you don't like, that person who annoys you, that person that you don't mind cursing out, that person that you don't want as a neighbor, that person who you don't want as a friend, the very first thing God called me to do is to be a light to them, to be that example to them, to love them unconditionally. It, love does not mean you do whatever a person say. Love means that I'm taking all what the scriptures say and apply to the relationship that I have with this person. So the Bible says love is not um, selfish. Love is not easily irritable. I'm applying all that the Bible say about what love is in this relationship. And the only person that can stop it is that person. <laughs> so yeah. I may have finance to help you with your bill, but if you're a gambler, I can't help you. I want to. I want to express love to you with my money, but guess what? You're an addict. You know, you're irresponsible. So I can't express love to you in this way because you're the one who's stopping it. Because of your maturity level, um, I'm unable to express love. But the love is there, just can't express it to you because of who you are, the state that you're in. So God called me to love people and understand that when that gay person profess, make a profession of faith, or that racist, or that thief, or that fornicator, or that lustful person, that adulterous, that alcoholic, or whatever. Remember that they are a new creature in Christ. They become a new creature in Christ. And God called me to love them, and to serve them, and to be an example for them. The second reason why God allowed certain people in your life for you to learn either what to be like or what not to be like. So you may have a, a neighbor who's an alcoholic, 
when you watch his life, you said, you know, Lord, I'm not saying I'm better than this person, but I don't want to be like this person while being an example for that person. Or you may have a neighbor who's responsible with their money and I use them to judge me. Um, I want to be like that. I want to be responsible with my money. Third, why God allows certain people in your life is for this very fact. Sometimes the people that we dislike, the people that we that get us angry, the people that get us easily ticked off, many times when you search yourself, you're like them. So God may allow people in your life to examine your own life. I may be just as guilty in what I'm accusing them of. So now, when we come to God and start to pray according to what is said here, this then is how you should pray. We have to keep into consideration that, hey, it's our Father. I once was lost in sin, and Jesus took me in. But he didn't just take me in. He took all, he take all kind of culture, people, ethnic group, and all of that in. And they are my brothers and sisters in the faith. And when I approach God, I approach him as our father in heaven. And it said here, hallowed be your name. Woo. I don't know about you. I want to look at that. Look at that. Hallowed, holy, sanctified, blessed, consecrated. So now, when we think of hallowed, we are blessing his name. We know his name is holy. I don't use it in vain. So when I'm praying, I have in mind that I'm approaching God being saved. I'm approaching him as our father. So I have brothers and sisters in the faith that belong to this very same father. Then his name is holy and righteous and amazing to me. So now... This is the way I'm approaching God. So now it said here, your kingdom come. So number one, this world is not just, this world is not it for me. Maybe for you, no? There's a hell. But, I anticipate God rule on this earth when he will come back for us and he will rule this world with a rod of iron and we see all that the scriptures say. So when I'm praying to God, I want, I anticipate his return. Not only that, I want to also, while I'm here on earth, I want everything about his kingdom to be ruling in my heart while I'm here also. And it said here, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I also have in mind that God is sovereign. And I don't have to depend on this world. My dependency on God. He have everything in control. Who is going to be president? Who is not going to be president? And even though gas mileage is high, he's still sovereign. Because he could say, listen, I'm going to make sure your, your tank is full all the time. No matter who the president is. So my trust is in God because he's sovereign. He's a, he said that his eyes are in every place is seeing the good and evil. My father transcends this universe. 
he cannot be overthrown. You can't vote him out. He's all powerful. God don't have to do anything and this world could just be destroyed. Maybe by just the tip of his toe or the touch of his finger. So this is the God that I trust. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient, omnipresent. This is the God who I surrender to. And it says, so let's read uh, again. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Look at this. And I'm going to stop on verse 11. Look at this, what it say right here. You ready for it? I don't hear you. Look at this. It said, ha, um, no, it said in verse 11, give us today our daily bread. This is one of the reasons why we don't live a victorious life. And many times we don't get what we ask for from God. Even though we may say, Lord, give us today our daily bread. That's not what we are always asking for. What we are asking for is, Lord, give me four, five, six refrigerator full, one with lobsters, one with shrimp, steak, and all of that. That's when we feel as though um, we're getting our daily bread. Because we like security. We don't want to be in a place where we don't have three to six month rent in our bank account. We, we want to be in a place where, yeah, Lord, I love you and I'm trusting you. But if my bank account go below a certain amount, I get nervous. Then are you really trusting? Then it says here that... Um, Give us today our daily bread. Do we really want daily bread? Or do we want bread for an entire month? You see, we saw this. When the children of Israel left Egypt, they would store the manna in their tent. And what did God do? Cause it to rotten. I know a lot of people with rotten food. Because I want to store up food forever. So I don't really, what I'm saying is that, Lord, I really don't want to trust you when it comes to my food and my money. So I want that fat bank account. I want my refrigerator, all six of them stacked from top to bottom. Then I know you are providing. Other countries, um, even growing up as a kid in Jamaica, <sighs> Um, many times I remember my great grandmother used to go out, pick the potato, um, dig a hole, light a fire and roast the potato. Um, sometimes we didn't know where food was coming from, but I always ate. Some people got to hunt for their food. Some people, if they don't go out and find uh, provision, they're not going to eat. So they know what it is to trust God for their daily bread. In America here, it's hard for us to understand that verse. Because any of us could walk up to any fast food restaurant and say, I'm homeless, can you feed me? And somebody will. So we have a tendency of trusting people, trusting the government, but not really trusting God. That's why some of us go went crazy when Joe Biden got in office, because we felt as though we was losing America. But Joe Biden is God's Joe Biden. He's there to bid God's will. If God wanted Trump there, Trump would have been there. But you see, we want Trump there because we don't want to struggle. 
We don't want to go through hardship. We don't want this, but we feel as though that God can provide for us. The omnipotent God who's all powerful, knows everything, knows our need before we act. You telling me that he can't provide for you? And that's why God have to allow us to be in a state where we have no choice but to trust them. We have no choice but to trust them because the experience ain't there. I've been taken care of from when I was a kid all the way till now. I don't know what it is to struggle, many of us. And that is why when God, when we pray, God wants to make us and mold us into who he wants us to be. So we can grow spiritually and get to know him in a more magnificent way. Peace out. We'll continue in the future in Matthew chapter 6. The Lord's Prayer. I hope you learned something from this. All right. If you haven't given your heart to Jesus Christ as yet. Today is the day of salvation. Do not harden your heart. Give your life to him. Peace out.